and we have started looking at the uh, EUV Malanda Sutra in the Anguttarikaya, the numerical discourses, uh, the tens number 60. Yeah. And again, this is about developing a variety of different kinds of perceptions. Uh, and in many ways, the first one that we have already looked at is perhaps the most important one, which is the one about the impermanence, unreliability, uncertainty in the world. Uh, and uh, even though it may seem very specific, it talks about the five aspects or the five pandas, uh, the five um, uh, grasping aggregates. Uh, it actually, this is really about everything in our experience. So, uh, ah, excellent. Yeah. This is the Jasmine B. Ah, excellent. So this, it may seem kind of limited, but actually everything in our experience ultimately is the five pandas. Yeah? So if things that may seem to be in the external world, even though things are in the external world, they are experienced in our pandas. So it's part of our pandas in a certain way. So everything can really be included in that. Yeah? So everything is impermanent. Everything is unreliable. Everything is uncertain. Yeah? And uh, it's uh, one of the really powerful ways of perceiving the world uh, to let go a little bit and then to move towards what really matters. Uh, so this is the first one here. Is it a little bit loud, the loudspeaker? It's a little bit funny uh, noises coming out of it. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, all right, so uh, that might be better. So now we come to the second one. This is the perception of not self. Uh, so this is the Anatta Sanya. And uh, it is similar to the previous one. And it goes as follows. What is the perception of not-self? It's when a mendicant has gone to a wilderness, uh, to the root of a tree, or to an empty hut, and reflects like this. Uh, the eye and sights, uh, the ear and sounds, uh, nose and smells, uh, tongue and taste, the uh, body and touches, uh, the mind and ideas are not-self. Uh, and so they meditate, or they dwell, observing not-self in the six interior and exterior sense fields. Uh, this is called the perception of not-self. And uh, so it's interesting here that uh, in the previous one, they're talking about the five pandas, uh, and now they're talking about the six sense fields. So why is that? Uh, why, is, why this shift? And uh, the... Uh, I think the, the reason is because the six senses, uh, that is where we want to be in control of our senses, yeah? because this is where we experience happiness, where we have enjoyment in the world, we want to see things that are nice to see, you want to hear nice sounds, uh, so we want to be in charge to some extent of our senses, so we can enjoy the world, uh, rather than actually have suffering in the world. Uh. So this is a kind of a contemplation that makes it clear that actually we're not in charge of our senses. Uh, our senses depends on a variety of conditions. Uh, and those conditions, or what we saw in the first couple of suttas, we looked at the Honeyball Sutta and the Greatest Sutta on the elephant's footprint. And the idea that when there is the object, there is the uh, sight, uh, there is the object to be seen, uh, the consciousness, uh, uh, arises, and then there is the attention, in which kind of pays attention to that thing, then there is contact with the world. And that whole thing is really often comes because of past conditioning, because of past causes, especially the attention that we pay to the world will come from our own defilements, our own habits in the past, our own delusions. And so we are trapped in a sense, we will not see what is really there, we will see what our minds allows us to see, and we will see it in a distorted fashion. And all of that is non-self. And that means that all of these things that we experience are less interesting than we think they are. If we're not really in control, if these things arise out of cause and conditions, it means that straight away it loses some of its luster, some of its beauty in a sense, because it happens according to cause and conditions. So this is, I think, uh, the idea here uh, behind the, this, yeah? And especially the five senses, it's very useful to always reflect on the five senses uh, 
And the reason, of course, is that in meditation, the less attachment we have to the five senses, the better our meditation tends to work. And for this reason, you will see this one too begins in the same way as the previous one. And it begins with gone to the wilderness to the root of a tree. So this is all about someone who is keen on meditation, and someone who is already heading in the right direction. And so these are profound things. They're not really kind of to be done just willy-nilly for anyone. It's someone who is really practicing this path fully, even going off into seclusion. Yeah, someone that, that, that monastic or maybe a lay person who's really practicing kind of in a deep sense. So this is the uh, idea behind this. Yeah, the senses are essentially out of control. Uh, the experiences we have in the world arise out of cause and conditions, uh, and we cannot ultimately we cannot control what is going on. Uh, and uh, even the little control that we feel we have, uh, that in itself is ultimately conditioned by other factors uh, like our delusion, our lack of understanding, uh, our previous habits, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, This is the idea of uh, perception of uh, non-self in the six external and internal senses. What is the perception of ugliness? This is the asuba perception, uh, asuba sanya. It is when a mentor can examine their own body up from the soles of the feet and down from the tips of the hair wrapped in skin and full of many kinds of filth. <laughs> in this body there is head hair, body hair, nail, teeth, skin, flesh, sinews, bones, bone marrow, kidney, heart, liver, diaphragm, spleen, lungs, intestines, mesentery, undigested food, feces, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, grease, saliva, snot, synovial fluid, and urine. And so they meditate observing the ugliness, so the asuba, the non-beauty in the body, this is called the perception of ugliness. So the Pali word for ugliness here is asuba. It literally means something like you know, suba is kind of beautiful. This is the non-beautiful, if you like. The prefix a, it either inverts the meaning, so it goes from beautiful to ugly, or it is uh, takes away the meaning, so it means like non-beautiful. So Non-beautiful is not exactly the same as ugly, yeah, so either those translations might be correct. Uh, and so you examine this body, yeah, up from the sole of the feet, down from the tips of the head, in other words, everything, the entire body, uh, wrapped in skin, the skin is like the boundary uh, between the body and the outer world, uh, and you review it as full of all of these impurities, yeah, or filth. Uh, asuchi, I think, is the Pali word. Uh, asuchi means, um, yeah, uh, impure, filthy, something like that. It's not, that's roughly what it means. Uh, so when should we do this kind of contemplation? Uh, is this, should we, everyone do this kind of contemplation, or should just some people do it? When should we do it? Uh, and to be able to understand when to do this kind of contemplation, you have to understand where it happens on the Noble Eightfold Path, right? And of course, the, in the Noble Eightfold Path, it happens in the Satipatthana Sutta. And Satipatthana is all about meditation practice. Yeah, the main part of Satipatthana is the mindfulness of breathing. And so the purpose of this is in connection with deeper aspects of meditation. When meditation really starts to work. Yeah, And uh, what you often find when you do meditation practice, uh, and many of you have mentioned this already, sometimes you reach like a plateau. It doesn't go deeper. You become reasonably peaceful, and it kind of stops there. Yeah? And you do this, and maybe over long periods of time, it doesn't go particularly beyond a certain point. Uh, why is that? Uh, and the reason is almost always, well, there's two reasons. One is that you need to purify your virtue more. I've talked about this a lot. Uh, but the other one is because you have some attachments in the world, and those attachments are usually found in relation to the body and the five senses. They are very closely related to, to each other, the body and the five senses. And, and so the purpose of this sort of thing is for uh, someone who's really dedicated to meditation in a deep way, uh, yeah, like someone who goes on long retreats and that sort of thing, uh, to overcome some of the attachments. That's the purpose of this kind of thing. Uh, 
And then as your attachments recede, as they are given up, you find your meditation deepens. And then you do it a bit more, and it deepens in this way. This is the purpose of this. So then you can know for yourself whether you should be doing these kind of things or not. Generally speaking, I would not recommend this kind of um, thing for lay people. Yeah, even most monastics, I don't think, do this kind of thing. And sometimes it's done, but not that often. But Ram never did uh, this kind of practice, and then his meditation is really good. So I would say it is not, you know, it is very counter to an ordinary lay life, because lay life is, after all, to some extent, the enjoyment of the five senses. Uh, and this kind of clashes with that. Uh, yeah, this is why it makes more sense as monastic to do this kind of practice. Uh, but it depends on how you live your lay life. Some people live, live lay life almost like a monastic, yeah. And they live a very pure and beautiful kind of lay life. And of course, then you can do it. So it depends how, what kind of lay life you have. Uh, but sometimes there's a clash between this kind of practice and the enjoyment of ordinary, the ordinary joys of lay life. And when there is a clash, which one is going to win? Uh, the enjoyment is always going to win, right? Because that is the mind is attracted to the enjoyment. And this is going to be hard and difficult to do that. So no the right time, the right place for this sort of practice. Otherwise, it's just going to be, it's going to be destructive uh, and lead to problems. So, so uh, the reason I read them out is because they are there, not because I necessarily suggest you should do these things, but it's there, right, in the sutta. So I have no choice, I have to read it out. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that that's, it fits into the picture of deeper aspects of meditation. That's where it fits in there, to loosen the attachment of the body. Yeah. The idea here is not to be repelled by the body. Yeah. The idea is not to become suicidal. Yeah. <laughs> there is a story in the Vindhya Pitaka. Some of you may know that story. It's the background story for Parajika too. Parajika are the most serious rules for the monastics and if you commit a parajic offense you're no longer a monastic yeah so if you kill another human being then you're no longer a monk monks are not allowed to kill human beings so. fair enough right uh, yeah <laughs> we cannot kill we cannot steal and etc so if you think we can do as monks then you're no longer a monk yeah. and uh, in that one of these parajic rules the one about killing living killing human beings uh, the, the Buddha gave this asuma practice, which is basically seeing the ugliness of the body. Yeah, so the monks were practicing this, and they didn't really have any other meditation object. It seemed in those days there was no metta, there was no anapanasati. It was just the ugliness of the body. That was the kind of one thing. Yeah, and then after teaching that, the Buddha went on retreat. Yeah? <laughs> and then he was on retreat for three months or something. Yeah? And then when he came out of retreat, the sangha was diminished. Yeah? And the Sangha is diminished because many monks had killed each other and committed suicide. And they had asked this uh, person called Migalandika to, you know, take, if you kill me, I will give you my robe and bowl. And so he had this large heap of bowl and robes uh, after killing all these monks. Uh, and uh, so you can see how it can go easily, things this can, can go wrong, right? And they don't really work out uh, properly. It's a strange story. I don't need to really understand it properly myself, to be honest, because it seems really over the top. Uh, but it shows you that uh, these things are uh, to be treated with caution and only in the right context. And it's there to give the mind balance rather than to give the mind a negative uh, uh, view of the body. Yeah, it's not supposed to be too negative, but it's to balance things out uh, so we don't have those kind of attachments. That's the idea. Uh, uh, but it is a kind of, yeah, it can be quite nice. It is very easy to see the body in this way. As I mentioned before, all we have to do is really strip off the skin of the body, and then it looks very, very different uh, once you do that. Uh, and this is really what we're doing here, uh, knowing uh, more thoroughly what, uh, what the body looks like, really. So um, you see these things in the body, uh, and uh, so this, you know, these are the things that the head, the hair, the body hair, the nail, teeth, skin, etc., etc. Um, all of these bits and pieces. And um, snot, snot is a good one. Uh, that's kind of, kind of blowing my nose recently. So snot is kind of at the forefront of my mind. 
And uh, so this is the nature of this body, and you remain observing the ugliness of the body in this way. Yeah. So that is the 31 parts of the body right there, not 32, but 31. There. And if you do 32, you will not get enlightened there. But if you do 31, then you will be on the right track here. Yeah. No, that's just uh, me messing around there. So <clears throat> that is that part, and you will notice, importantly, you look at your own body in this very body. Yeah, so it is about your, their own body. Yeah. So it is looking at your own body. That is kind of where we, the problem arises, attachment to one's own body. And then from there, that is from there you got then attached to other people's bodies and after that. That's why the emphasis is on one's own body when you do these kind of practices. So anyway, let's move on, on to the next one. And by the way, as I mentioned, that part that one is found also in the Satipatthana Sutta, and it seems to be maybe the original exercise in the Satipatthana Sutta. Yeah, the Satipatthana Sutta, for those of you who know it, has a number of uh, ways of practicing. You have the 31 parts of the body, you have the four elements, uh, you have the cemetery contemplations, uh, you have the uh, clear comprehension and mindfulness, so you have the four postures, and you have mindfulness of breathing. Yeah, six areas. Uh, and if you go to some of the other schools of Buddhism, like the Sadhasti Baden schools, that have ed additional exercises again, like the light, the jhanas are in there. What else do they have? They have a variety of other things in there as well. So, and that is one of those really interesting things. Yeah, one of the things that you will know if you've been around Buddhism for a while, that many people take Satipatthana Sutta to be the Sutta, yeah, which talks about meditation practice. This is the most important one. And if you practice Satipatthana Sutta, then that's it. This is what you need to do. But it is therefore very interesting. When you look at the different schools, and it is not the same sutta. So if someone tells you you should practice Satipatthana Sutta, you should reply, which one? Yeah, which one? Which one should I? Because if they are different, well, which one did the Buddha speak? Yeah. That kind of gets really, really interesting. Yeah. And this is uh, some of the interesting research that has been done. And this was one of the things that Bhante uh, Sujato is coming in February. You can ask him directly when he comes. Uh, this was one of his big research projects, looking at the various versions of the Satipatthana Sutta and trying to pull out what the original may have looked like. What did the Buddha actually teach? And this is very different from what you will hear in most of the Theravada world. Most of the Theravada world are wedded to the Pali version of the Satipatthana Sutta. But if you kind of go, go back from that and you realize that all of these versions have a should have an equal say, yeah, because they are just different schools. Different schools have evolved differently. And you look at the common denominator, you kind of come back to what maybe the Satipatthana Sutta was, what was taught by the Buddha himself. And then what you discover is that uh, some of these practices may not have been part of the Satipatthana Sutta. And so, you know, um, um, Adam Sudhartha calls it the Pilt Up Sutta piled up so that been piled up and has been added to over time. That's kind of basically the idea that he was uh, kind of uh, bringing out. Yeah, and uh, that makes it very fascinating. Yeah. And what you then discover is that the, probably the most original part is the 31 parts of the body. Yeah. This is the most original part. Uh, whereas things like clear comprehension, the four, four postures, uh, they are probably late. Uh, they only exist in some of the versions. Uh, and, big, and why is that? Well, because they actually belong on a different place on the Buddhist path. They belong before Satipatthana. And uh, when you read the suttas, you will see there is a clash between where it belongs in the practice. And, and that this kind of resolves the problem when you see that. Uh, and same thing with mindfulness of breathing. Mindfulness of breathing does not really belong under Kaya Nupassana contemplation of the body, which is the third first part of Satipatthana Sutta. Why does it not belong there? Because mindfulness of breathing belongs to the whole of Satipatthana, not just the first part. So this is why you get these strange things that you go to Vipassana meditation, they say, watch the breath, then go to the feelings of the body. Why? Because this is how what it looks like in the Satipatthana Sutta. Then you go to the Anapanasati Sutta, and it says, actually, Anapanasati fulfills the entire Satipatthana. Yeah? So it doesn't actually belong under 
the contemplation of the body belongs to the whole Satipatthana Sutta. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, then never mind. You have to <laughs> because this is a little bit involved, especially if you're new to these ideas, you probably, wow, what is this all about? And you have no idea. It's okay. It's not that important. It's just that uh, it's interesting. Yeah, and it's kind of, uh, that's why I like this. Some of you have been around for a long time. Uh, you will probably know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh. So uh, anyway, let's uh, get back to these uh, to the Girmananda Sutta. So that is the 31 parts of the body, not the 32, the 31. And what is the perception of drawbacks? It is when the mendicant has gone to the wilderness or to the root of a tree or to an empty hut and they reflect like this. This body has much suffering and many drawbacks. Adinava is the word for drawback. So drawback, um, well, other words uh, can be used for translating Adinava. Dangerous, thank you, dangerous, yeah, dangerous is a, is a nice one, because drawbacks is a little bit weak, perhaps, so dangerous actually is a nice translation. Thank you so much, Kim. So that's good. So, um, uh, for this body is beset with many kinds of affliction, uh, such as the following, uh, diseases of the eye, of the inner ear, of the nose, of the tongue, of the body, of the head, of the outer ear, of the mouth, of the teeth, of the lips, uh, Cold, asthma, catarrh, in inflammation, and fever, stomachache, fainting, dysentery, gastric pain, cholera, leprosy, boils, eczema, tuberculosis, and epilepsy, herpes, itch, scab, smallpox, scabies, hemorrhage, diabetes, piles, pimples, <laughs> and ulcers. That's an interesting combination of things. I'm not sure if pimples is an illness, but anyway, whatever it is. Um, affliction stemming from disorders of the bile, phlegm, wind, and the conjunction. Afflictions caused by change in weather, by not taking care of yourself, by overexertion, or as the result of past karma, past deeds. Cold, heat, hunger, thirst, defecation, and urination. And so they meditate, observing the dangers or the drawbacks in this body. This is called the perception of drawbacks. So this is a little bit similar to the previous one, yeah? seeing the dangers in the body in slightly different emphasis. And you will see again, it starts with the idea of going to the wilderness and to the root of a tree or to an empty hut. Yeah? So again, this is for a meditator. Yeah? You don't do these kind of things unless you're really keen on meditation and you want to reduce the attachment to the body. All of these things are meant to reduce the attachment of the body. Yeah? This is quite a rare meditation or rare reflection. I haven't seen it in many places, but um, I guess the Buddha gave us a bit of variety because we are a bit different, everyone. And some people will take more easily to some reflections, other to other kind of reflections. So. But it is for a serious meditator again. And when you feel that your something is getting in, in the way, you're plateauing in your meditation, and something doesn't work, you're only being stopped from going really deep. And, you're not really getting that uh, joy coming up or whatever in it. And a little bit of uh, weakening of the attachment to the body can be useful there. Yeah, so you need to know whether you are uh, kind of a um, on the highway to enlightenment or you are a little bit less committed. That's up to you to know how. So uh, you have a load of uh, different uh, uh, illnesses, of course, you can add to those illnesses if you wish. You can just keep on adding to the list. You can put modern illnesses in there, like uh, cancer and uh, uh, heart disease. And yeah, these kind of modern killers. And, and there's so much of in the modern world. You can add those to that list if you like. You really add whatever works. Um, then you have at the end, then you have this um, affliction stemming from disorders of the bile, phlegm, and wind. What is that all about? That sounds a bit weird. Now, this is the ancient Indian way of talking about illnesses. Yeah, the, the talk about illnesses, the imbalances of what they call the bodily humors. Uh, not humor as in laughing, but the bodily humors as in bodily uh, 
what, what does it mean? What's humor? Is it mean like bodily? Yeah. It functions, is it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, whatever. Some bodily something, yes. <laughs> and the conjunction. This is how diseases were uh, kind of divided up. So arthritis, for example, was considered a wind illness, uh, yeah, for example. And this is kind of the ancient Indian, the Ayurvedic. You've probably heard about Ayurvedic medicine, yeah? This goes back to the time of the Buddha and before. It's really ancient uh, Indian system there. Uh. So it is based on those ideas and so forth. So uh, you have this is one reason for affliction. And here in this sutta, you find the eight reasons for why there is suffering in life, yeah? And uh, this is one of many places where Kamma is only one of these eight ways. So here you have the affliction from by phlegm and wind, and the conjunction that's four. And you have affliction caused by the weather, Uju. Uju can also mean, no, not Uju, Uju can also mean seasons. Yeah, the weather or the seasons, the winter, summer, these kind of things. That's number five, not taking care of yourself. That's number six. Over exertion number seven, and then result of past actions come up is only the eighth one. Now, what is interesting here, this is actually translated quite differently by Bhikkhu Bodhi here. So, this is um, slightly worrying when you see such different translations. So I, don't, I don't tend to get that worried, but a little bit worried when I see uh, these things. Uh, so, let's have a quick look at what Bhikkhu. Bodhi has. Um. Huh. Ah, okay. So the Kibodhi stand I said that coming up and he has Instead, yeah, he, instead of weather, he had the climate, right? So kind of seasons, uh, yeah. Uh, careless behavior, and but the sujato had and, uh, not taking care of yourself, careless behavior, not taking care of yourself. Mm, I think I prefer careless behavior. I haven't really checked the visama pariharaja pariharada. Um, Parihara means to conduct yourself or how you look after yourself. Visama means unevenly, so uneven uh, conduct or something like that. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Anyway, you're not really, you are being careless in one way or another, by, either by not looking after yourself or by walking into the street without looking left or right. We talked a lot about that recently, so that kind of would be careless behavior. Uh, and then you have uh, illnesses produced by assault, is uh, what the Bhikkhu Bodhi has. Uh, and whereas uh, Bhattasar has overexertion. That's quite different, isn't it? Uh, overexertion and, and uh, assault. Uh, and the Pali word is opakamika, which is a diff difficult word. That's why that's the, the, this, there's disagreement between them. But uh, let's, I, I think I prefer. Uh, uh, assault that makes more sense to me then. So uh, regardless of how you look at this, then you can see that there are many, many reasons why there is suffering in life, why we have problems, right? Uh, illnesses are here said to be separate from karma, which is really interesting. Yeah. Usually people will ask, why well, I've got cancer, what karma did I do in the past? Uh, no karma, it just happens you have a body and you get cancer. Uh, unfortunately, that's the reality of having a body. Yeah. Um, then we have the idea of the climate, okay, that's kind of obvious. Uh, then we have the idea of uh, careless behavior. Uh, yeah, if you are not careful, uh, it doesn't mean that you have bad karma, it just means you're not careful. Uh, so if you, you know, if you are stupid and you walk, uh, Singapore doesn't have any dangerous areas, but if you walk into the wrong area of New York at night uh, or Mumbai in India at night, uh, you are in trouble. Why? Because you are careless. You're walking in the wrong place at the wrong time. So we have to look after ourselves. And we can't blame karma if we are being stupid. If we're being stupid, we are being stupid. That's the reason why we suffer. That's kind of interesting. Then the idea of assault. Yeah, if you, again, you get assaulted. Why? Because you were in the wrong place at the wrong time. So you get assaulted. 
Yeah, so it was a kind of a silly thing. And sometimes you are in the right place at the right time, you still get assaulted there because that kind of life is very uncertain. Yeah? And assault and, and in death sometimes if you're unlucky. Yeah? And so this shows us, and I think this is a very important point, uh, is not to blame everything on karma. This is my karma. Yeah? We have a responsibility to live in the right way. Yeah? And when we live in the right way, things tend to go well. You're also minimizing the chances of karma to ripen because you live wisely. Yeah? And so uh, this idea that everything comes from karma is a mistake in view. And it's very, very common in the Buddhist world, but actually it doesn't match the suit. It's uh, a lot of the reason why we have the problems we have is because we're human beings. Uh, and human beings, we have to expect a certain amount of suffering, certain amount of illness, uh, certain amount of troubles and problems and all kinds of things, uh, because that is what human life is like. Yeah. Is that true? No? Yeah, it's true, isn't it? Dad? Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. So that, that, that is an interesting big point, and it recurs a number of places in the Sutta. So uh, don't ever uh, ask yourself this question, why did it happen? What karma did I do in the past? It's irrelevant what karma you did in the past. Forget about that. Uh, um, it's a kind of a way that people try to get closure, but it doesn't really work. The idea is, if I did this bad karma in the past, and I understand the causes, and I will not do the same stupid thing in the future. But there are so many stupid things you can do just because you isolate one thing is not going to be all that helpful. So it's kind of not a very useful way of thinking about things. Much better to think, what should I do from now on? You have to live well and to ensure minimum problems in the future. That is a better way to think rather than to think of specific causes. The other thing which is very dangerous with the ideas of karma is that very often we blame the victims in the world. Yeah, it is their karma, they did something bad in the past, and now they have to experience the results. And that is a very bad way of thinking for a Buddhist, because it makes you cold. If you don't care anymore about people, because if it's their fault, then why should you care? And uh, it's quite a common view in the Buddhist world, but actually it's completely wrong. It is not the right way of thinking about things, because it may have nothing to do with karma. We see that here. But even if it has to do with karma, we have all done bad karma in the past. And soon enough, it will be our turn to experience the results of bad karma. And all of these things are non-self. All of these things happen according to cause and conditions. We can't really blame people for their bad actions anyway, because they are caused and conditioned into those things. So the answer is always to have compassion instead of blaming the victim for their suffering. That's never the answer. It is just cold-hearted and it makes you, makes us as well into bad people if we have cold hearts towards other people who are suffering. So these are some of the pitfalls of the Buddhist world and how people often think about these things in the wrong way. So please, please don't do that because it will be bad. All right, uh, let's go on to the next perception. What is the perception of giving up? This is the Bahana Sanyana Pali. It is when a mendicant doesn't tolerate the sensual or a sensory uh, Ill, thought of ill will or a thought of uh, rudeness that has arisen there. They don't tolerate any bad, unskillful qualities that have arisen, but give them up, get rid of them, eliminate them, and obliterate them. This is called the perception of giving up. Pahana Sanya. And this is a, a perception that is useful for everyone to some extent, because this is a, about dealing with the mental content of our minds and overcoming the bad content and developing the good content. And so this is how the bad content of the mind is usually divided up into these three things. Uh, one of them is like greed or sensory indulgence, and then the really bad one, which is ill will, and then also the idea of being ruthless, not caring. So the last two are opposites of metta and compassion, karuna. And so we don't tolerate these things. We deal with them. This is the perception of giving up. 
you have this idea in your mind that these things are to be given up and you develop that strongly so when these things arise you use these methods for overcoming because the perception of giving up is strong in you this is really what it is referring to the eliminating of these things and so how do we do this elimination well you will find this in the uh, Dreda Vitaka Sutta, the two kinds of thought, and yeah, Mahdi Malikaya number 19, it's a beautiful sutta where the Buddha talks about his own life before his awakening and how he dealt with these things. And as I mentioned before, what you find there is that it is all about using wisdom power to overcome these things. There's really nothing there about willpower at all. So when again you see the words here, eliminate, get rid of, obliterate, it does not mean willpower, it means wisdom power, using wisdom. What specifically does the Buddha say in the Dveda Vitaka Sutta? And what he specifically says is that you reflect like this. This is how the Buddha to be reflected before his awakening. You reflect this thought leads to my own suffering. It leads to the suffering of others. It leads to the suffering of both. Yeah. So you, the first thing that we have to understand is that all of these thoughts lead to suffering in the world. This already is quite difficult to understand. Okay, ill will, we can understand that. Because if we act out of ill will, of course, it's going to be detrimental for others. That is kind of obvious. Ruthlessness. Bad for others, bad for you, yes, because you have a cold heart, you don't care about things, and that coldness actually leads to bad results in the future. You know? Sens sensuality, sensory realm, is that bad for both? But that is more difficult to see, and that is where you have to contemplate more. Some of the symbolism I mentioned before about how the five sense world, there's always conflict, for example, is one way of thinking about that. Yeah? <laughs> The idea of the borrowed goods, if you attach too much to borrowed goods, you have a problem because you're going to have to let go of them. And so the, some of these beautiful similes can be very useful to understand how even that five sense realm ultimately leads to suffering for everyone. And in the end, it's about attachment. Yeah, you attach. And when you attach to someone else, you start to control them, you want them to behave in a certain way, and then when eventually they go, you suffer because they have to go eventually. Yeah. So obviously there is a there is problems there. Yeah. So you learn these kind of reflections. And as you do that, you see the danger in excessive greed, in excessive attachment to that room. Yeah. And the Buddha says, the Buddha TV says, well, when I thought like that, as soon as I thought like that, bang, it disappeared, it was gone. So if you fully understand the danger of these things, if you really see this in a deep way, then as soon as you turn your mind to that danger, to that suffering that arises out of these thoughts, the thoughts just go poof, and they're gone. Yeah, why? Because you know, why, why? it's like picking up a hot coal, yeah? If you pick up a hot coal, you don't have to think very much, should I let it go, should I let it go? Or, uh, as soon as you start thinking, it's too late. You've already burned yourself. So you just get let go straight away of the hot coal. And this is kind of the idea with these thoughts. You understand they are like hot coals. They burn immediately. And so you turn in a different direction because you know it's suffering. In fact, it is much more suffering than picking up a hot coal. It's weird how the ordinary little sufferings on, on, of life, we let go straight away. We know it's a problem even though they are small compared to the big suffering that we inflict on ourselves because we don't understand that we are inflicting large sufferings on ourselves. So this takes reflection, understanding the danger in these things. And it's hard because some of these thoughts are very compelling. Yeah, when you get angry with someone, it is very compelling. It drives actions, anger. Yeah, it makes you say things because you think I have to tell them off. I have to tell them the truth. They need to know reality. They don't see things clearly. No, you are the one who doesn't see clearly. Right? That's the problem. Right? And so we have to know that compulsion in us to act. We have to hold back. And then when we do that, then we kind of uh, we learn how to deal with this in the right way. Right? And then the Buddha says, the Buddha Tibi says. Uh, so suffering of yourself, suffering of others, suffering of both. And this says it leads to the cessation of, suf of uh, wisdom, panya nirodika. Yeah, cessation of wisdom, that's pretty bad, isn't it? We all want to be wise. Is anyone here who doesn't want to be wise? 
you come to the wrong place. Uh, you don't want to be wise. Uh, this is where wisdom happens. It gradually kind of it's, uh, it's inserted into you whether you want to or not, because the Buddha's what the Buddha does. So he kind of uh, brings the wisdom into the world there. Uh, so everyone wants to be wise. Okay, good. Uh, I was getting worried for a second. Someone might raise their hand. Uh, wisdom can be painful as well, right? Because seeing things clearly, there can be a initial rejection of that because uh, you know, our defilements don't often not want to see things clearly. Yeah. So if something destroys wisdom, in my opinion, it's really, really bad. Yeah? Because wisdom is obvious that we want to be wise, I think. Because wise means you get a handle on life. It means you understand how to live in the right way. That's the beauty of wisdom. Right? It is different from intelligence. Intelligence makes you good maybe at mathematics or physics or you know, making the bottom line of the company grow. Maybe you could get up those because you're intelligent. But wisdom is far more powerful because it teaches you how to deal with life itself. And then it says it is uh, agata. Agata something? Agata means like um, painful or suffering. Yes, yeah, so it leads to suffering. It has to do with distress. And the last one is uh, nibbana. Asambhattavika, it leads away from Nibbana, these kind of thoughts. So all of these things are things you reflect on. These are reflections, yeah? And from those reflections, they disappear. Yeah? And that is the power of wisdom. So uh, reflection is such an important part of the Buddhist path. Yeah? So this is how you overcome these things, uh, yeah? these kind of qualities, these bad qualities. Yeah? So this is the pahana sanya, the perception of abandoning or giving up. But, uh, please have a look at Matthew Manikai 19, the two kinds of thought, Veda Vitaka Sutta. It is one of my favorite suttas. And <laughs> I don't know, it's true though. It is about one of my favorite suttas. I really like that one. It has lots of nice similes and goes all the way to awakening. It's about the Buddha. In his life, what he did to practice, lots of beautiful things in that sutta. All right, let's go on to the next one here. What is the perception of fading away here? It's when a mendicant again has gone to the wilderness, or to the root of a tree, or to an empty hut, and he reflects like this. This is peaceful, this is sublime, that is the stilling of all activities, the letting go of all attachments, uh, the ending of craving, fading away extinguishment. Uh, this is called the perception of fading away. Fading away or, uh, or uh, dispassion is not a translation for fading away. So fading away or dispassion, depending on how you look at it. Uh, yeah, so again, this is a very profound thing. Again, we have the starts of the gone to the wilderness. This is like a real meditator who is practicing uh, and uh, here you're turning your mind effectively towards Nibbana, really. That is what you're turning your mind to, yeah? This is peaceful, this is sublime. Etan santang, etan panitang is the Pali. Yeah, sublime is a really nice word, isn't it? Sublime is something that is really attractive, uh, something special, something way above the ordinary. Yeah? Sublime state of peace. Uh, it is like the high deva loka. They are sublime, beautiful, peaceful, uh, wonderful places. Uh, this is not coarse. This is refined. Yeah, the refined kind of happiness, uh, happiness beyond happiness, the bliss upon bliss upon bliss, etc., etc. It is sublime. Uh, so, what is this sublimity? Uh, I'm not sure if that's a word, but anyway, I just now it is a word, I guess. Uh, what is this sublimeness? So whatever. How do you say that? Uh, well, it is the following. The stilling of all activities. Uh, sabbe sankara samata. Yeah. What is the stilling? What does that mean? Sabbe sankara samata. And sankara is, uh, is the will of the mind. Yeah. It is the activity of the mind. That is what sankara is. Uh, it is the driving force inside of us uh, that makes us act. It's the volition, the intention. Uh, yeah, the, the will that makes us move, that makes us do anything in this world. And when you still those completely, yeah, yeah, they're completely gone. That is what is sublime. That is what is peaceful. Yeah. And this is a very powerful statement. Yeah. And the reason it is so powerful is because it goes completely against our ordinary way of thinking about the world. Yeah. 
The will is considered such an important part of who we are. We identify very strongly with the will. That's why in the five khandas, one of them is the Sankara Kanda. That is the aspect of your person. That is the will. That is the intention inside of you. And the reason why the Buddha makes the Sankara one of the five khandas is precisely because we invest our sense of self in those Sankaras. That is where we see our sense of self. I am the doer. I am the will. I am the creator. I am the artistic genius that makes beautiful whatever. Yeah? We invest so much into doing. We are doers. One of the main identities that we have is the doing identity. And the other one is like the knowing. We are the knower who, are, who is aware of the world. And so this goes completely against our sense of self. This is why it's such a powerful thing. Yeah? But we also know that this is true. As I've already said this many, many times now. Right? That when you become peaceful in your meditation, things are much better, right? And you start, start to undermine that sense of self uh, because you understand, actually, this sense of self is an illusion. I rejoice in this doer, and actually the doer is something yeah? The more peaceful you become, the less doing there is, the more happy you are. And you realize you have been ripped off. You have been deluded. You have thought that this is an important part of you, but actually it is just something. This is what we mean by deep insight in Buddhism. When you start to see that some of the fundamental things that we take to be ourselves turn out to be suffering instead. And this is why it is so hard to see that. And this is why most of the world sometimes think that Buddhists are nuts because we are we take the most delightful things of existence, we turn it upside down, and we show that actually it is problematic. And this is really really interesting. Yeah, and uh, so this is why uh, when you become an arahant and you have a full insight into non-self and you understand that our will is conditioned, and we do things because of conditioning, that has nothing to do with me understanding the right thing or whatever, you stop this and come around, sir. And an arrow. <clears throat> so an arrow doesn't create things anymore in an ordinary way. Doesn't have some ordinary sankaras. Uh, it doesn't. An arahant doesn't go into the world to create happiness anymore. Uh, an arahant is more like, yes, I have to exist, so I have to do things, I have to eat, I have to breathe, and so it does. She does those things, uh, but it doesn't actually think that I should use my will to create a world, or create happiness, or create a life, or create whatever. Uh, the will is just functional in a sense uh, to be able to do things. And when the Arahant wants to be happy, he doesn't do that by acting in the world. He does that by not acting in the world, uh, by stopping the Sankaras and going into the Jhanas uh, where there is no will. That is where they get their happiness, precisely because the will stops in those states. Uh, that is precisely why they're happy there. Uh. So Sambhai Sankara Samatha is this beautiful idea. And this is what happens when you become an Arahant. And because you have no attachment to the will, you enter the jhana states really, really easily as a consequence. So notice this in your meditation, and you will be able to take little steps towards understanding the, the power of these ideas. So Sambhai Sankara Samatha, yeah? And then you have the letting go of all attachments. Sambhupadi Patinis. Attachments here, upadi, are like ownerships, the things that we feel we own in the world, yeah? everything we get attached to, right? starting with all the external things in our life, all our possessions, all our relationships where we are attached, yeah? the status that we have in society, yeah? and then moving on to the inner attachment, the attachments to our body, yeah? the attachments to uh, uh, the doer inside, to the feelings we have, to the perceptions that we have, uh, all our inner mental world, uh, whatever attachments we have there. Yeah, so this includes everything. Upadi is everything that we take to own in one way or another. We let go of all of those things. Why? Because you know they're out of control, and you know that if you attach, it will lead to only one thing, which is suffering in the future. Right? And then you let go of craving, yeah, because craving itself is part of the problem. 
Braving is part of the uh, activities that we do. Braving does not lead you to any happiness. Uh, it is the opposite. It is the stilling of all things that lead to happiness, the non-doing rather than the doing. So craving is a misunderstanding. It cannot gain happiness that way. It is by giving it up. Uh, fading away, this again is the fading away of defilements, specifically craving. Extinguishment is Nibbana, and it is the extinguishment, first and foremost, of the defilements of the mind, uh, uh, headed by the doing and the craving and these things. Uh, this is called the perception of fading away. So uh, there you are, perception of fading away now. And then comes the perception of cessation now. What is the perception of cessation now? It's when the mendicant again has gone to the wilderness, uh, to the root of a tree, or to an empty hut. So again, we're talking about someone who is really serious about meditation. This is not for the uh, faint-hearted, uh, these kind of uh, perceptions. Uh, <clears throat> and they reflect like this. This is peaceful. This is sublime. That is the stilling of all activities, the letting go of all attachments, the ending of craving, cessation, extinguishment. So this is called the perception of cessation. So almost exactly the same as the previous one. The only difference is that fading away is now cessation. Otherwise, it's exactly the same. So the ending of things, the ending of craving, the ending of defilements, uh, Cessation of things. Uh, cessation is good in Buddhism. Uh, endings are the kind of the highest kind of happiness in Buddhism. Uh, when everything comes to an end, uh, when the, this retreat comes to an end. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? Is that happiness or is it something? I'm not sure. That's kind of an certain one. That's kind of a uh, but usually endings are good, yeah, because then you can let go when things come to an end, especially things that aren't burdensome. And of course, the, when you meditate, you become peaceful, then the ending is not so good, but the, many endings are, are good. So I, uh, this is really profound stuff. I hope you are okay with all of these profound things. It's not, some of them are really useful, some of them are like um, interesting, yeah. and so I hope you can. Uh, and make a little bit of sense of it. Now we come to one that is much more practical, in my opinion, and one that uh, yeah, you should be able to use in your uh, <coughs> ordinary life, even. And what is the perception of dissatisfaction or discontent with the whole world? It is when a mendicant lives giving up and not grasping and on to the attraction and grasping to the world. Uh, the mental fixation, insisting, insistence and in underlying tendencies. Uh, this is called the perception of dissatisfaction with the whole world. When we talk about the whole world, in the, the Dhamma usually it refers to the five sense world. Yeah. It's interesting how the world, the, the word world, the part of the word world. How the word world is used very similar in the Pali uh, as it is in English. Uh, in Pali, it is loka, which is world, uh, and uh, it has almost exactly the same meaning as in English. Uh, yeah? So usually, if you say the whole world, uh, you think about maybe all of humanity. Yeah? The whole world says uh, it's about humanity. Uh, or the whole or the world can mean the planet Earth. Yeah? It can mean the world. Uh, or the world can mean like the whole universe, if you really think about it. So the world has different meaning depending on the context of English. And it's exactly the same in Pali. Yeah? It can mean humanity, it can mean the planet. Uh, but in Pali, it can also mean the five sense world uh, because of the way that uh, the uh, Buddhist uh, doctrine or teachings go. It can also mean that. So they mean the five sense world. This is a very common, quite a common use in the suttas. Uh, for example, we find in the suit as you go to the end of the world, Lokanta, where is the end of the world? In the jhana states. Yeah, because precisely because it refers to the five sense world, but when you go to the jhana states, you're out of the five sense world, you come to the end of the world. Yeah, it's kind of fascinating. Yeah, that's the end of the world, the Lokanta. And what happens at the end of the world? 
I don't know if there's a restaurant there, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a thing. Anyway, the end of the world. Then. But um, um, what happens then is Mala can no, no longer get hold of you. It says there's actually no restaurant there at all. It's the almost opposite. Mara can no longer get hold of you at the end of the world. And that means you have gone beyond the five senses. Yeah, Mara is the master operator of the five senses. Lures you back in, tricks you, man. yeah, and uh, then you are trapped by Mara. That's the end of the world. And then this monk who is coming in February for the retreat, Bhante Sujato, his monastery is called the Lok Anta Vihara, the monastery at the end of the world. There. So where do you think that is? Should be in the forest somewhere, right? Far away in the forest at the end of the world? No, it's in the middle of the city. Yeah. <laughs> That's a bit of a downer, right? It's supposed to be far away. So you can challenge him on that one. Ask him, if you have the monastery at the end of the world, why is it in the city? And see what he says about that. Yeah. <laughs> so don't. Should be in New Zealand. Is that right? Okay. New Zealand says Eileen. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so this is the uh, non-delight in the whole world, yeah, the whole world of the five senses. Uh, and uh, this is the kind of perception uh, that is a kind of a global perception uh, that kind of helps you to reject the world of the five senses, yeah? And you can do that sometimes very simply by just, again, just reminding yourself of all the uncertainties in the world, yeah? How we don't know what's going to happen next. Uh, What's going to happen? No one knew the war in Ukraine was going to happen. It came out of the blue. Suddenly there was a war in Ukraine. Nobody had thought that. This shows you how unreliable it is. Yeah, COVID, we probably should have known, but still we were surprised when it came, even though apparently the uh, pandemologists, whatever they call the ones who know about pandemics, they say we should always expect pandemics, but still we weren't kind of ready for it. So there's always this thing is the world is so unreliable, so uncertain, and often it causes such enormous amounts of suffering. And look at the pandemic and look at the many people who suffered during the pandemic and how a lot of mental illness and depression and sadness and loneliness was caused by a little virus. Yeah, really. And these little simple little things are out of control. And of course, it will happen again. Now we think we're out of the pandemic. There's always another pandemic around the corner. If it isn't the virus or something else, maybe a computer virus. <laughs> yeah, so this is kind of how it goes. The world is so uncertain. All of these things are brewing up under the surface, waiting to erupt into a volcano or an earthquake. We're always walking on shaky ground, always waiting for the next earthquake to you know, throw us over the cliff or whatever it is, and then we suffer accordingly. Now, this is all metaphorical for the uncertainty of the world. Uh, it is very, very unreliable and uncertain. Uh, and every time you watch TV or you read the news uh, and you feel disappointed with the world, it's because you haven't really fully taken on board the unreliability of things. Uh, we should expect things to go wrong. Uh, we should expect the unexpected. Uh, so please expect the unexpected. Uh, yeah, it's hard to expect the unexpected, but don't be too surprised if the unexpected happens. In fact, be surprised if the unexpected does not happen. That is when you should be surprised. Though. So expect the unexpected. So this is the idea of not divine in the whole world. Always so unreliable. And then what do we do? Well, then we do exactly what I mentioned the other day. You find the refuge within instead. But the Buddha says to Venerable Ananda, you should be an island unto yourself. The Dhamma should be your island. Yeah, Atta Deepa, Dhamma Deepa, which you find in the beautiful Mahaparinibbana Sutta. Close your eyes, feel good about yourself because you have been living a good life. And then go to the breath, watch the breath, and allow yourself to become peaceful within. That is where you find the refuge from the world outside. You build up the bliss, the happiness, the joy within there. Ajahn Shah famous called, famously called Samadhi our real home. This is the real home because this is where we can withdraw from the dangers outside. What is the purpose of a home? A purpose of a home is to have a place where you can feel free from the dangers of the world. You have a good bed at night you can sleep in. You have a place where you have a kitchen you can make food for yourself and you can feel kind of have your little safe space in the world. That's what the home is all about. 
But actually, that external harm isn't all that safe because it can be affected by all the things of the world. But the inner harm, that is the real harm when we withdraw to. And then the whole world becomes unavailable and incapable of affecting us. And that's where we find that freedom. We find that beautiful refuge from all the problems around us. Isn't that wonderful that there is such a thing? It's such a beautiful idea. This is what the Buddha has bequeathed us, what he has given us, uh, this ability to withdraw completely from the world, yeah, and find a refuge inside, find a refuge through meditation, and ultimately through insight itself, uh, yeah, and you become independent, uh, you become free from all of these things in the world. It's really wonderful, and it's what I find so extraordinary about it is that where the whole rest of the world are suffering because the world is going wrong yeah we use that very perception of the world to go wrong to encourage a spiritual practice and then through that danger of the world through all of those things that makes everyone else depressed we use it to create happiness inside because it enables us to let go it's kind of fascinating how we turn the threat into an opportunity like this this is what we're doing by reflecting in the right way. This is why the idea of right view is so important, yeah? Wrong view means you suffer. Right view means you find happiness in the most desperate kind of situation. There's something really extraordinary and powerful about this, uh, and really beautiful and uplifting uh, and supportive, uh, and can make you positive and optimistic, uh, right in the midst of all the problems uh, that exist in our life and in the world. Uh, so this is the Sabba Loke Anabhidatta and Anabhidatti Sanya, the perception of dissatisfaction in the whole world. Uh, this is how we can use that. And then you're grasping to that world of the five senses. Uh, you have the mental fixation of that, the insistence on that world, the underlying tendency to be interested in that world. All of that is loosened. You don't give it up straight away. It takes time, but you loosen it stage by stage. Uh, and this is something every one of us can do. And actually, it is very useful at times like this when there are so many troubles in the world. Next one. What is the perception then of the impermanence of all conditions? So, the conditions here is Sankara. This is uh, this it would be the uh, Sambhya Sankara Aniksha Sanya, something like that. Uh, so conditions here, I think it's better to translate it as phenomena, to be honest. I feel that is more easily understandable. Condition to me means something I call to something else, but uh, here it really refers to all phenomena in the world. Uh, and it's when the mendicant is horrified, repelled, and disgusted with all phenomena. This is called the perception of impermanence of all phenomena. So you are see the danger in all phenomena because they are impermanent. Uh, and then you get repelled by them. Uh, they are disgusted, horrified, uh, horrified by them. I like this, this translation here. Uh, it's basically the quite close to the palace, I think is quite accurate. Uh, again, it comes from understanding the danger of impermanence. You don't want to attach, right? This is like the anti-attachment, uh, the opposite of attachment. Uh, you understand the danger of holding on to something that is actually impossible to hold on to because it's always going to slip through your hand like sand between your fingers and cannot be held on to. This is called the perception of the impermanence of all phenomena. Now we come to the last one, and this is the mindfulness of breathing. This is the same mindfulness of breathing that we find in the Anapanasati Sutra, and it is a Important meditation, and you know that because it is found in so many places, and one of those places being right here. So we even get the chance to go briefly through the whole process of mindfulness of breathing, yeah, which is cool, huh? and, and so we will do that. Uh, and what is mindfulness of breathing? Yeah? It is when a mendicant has gone to the wilderness, uh, to the root of a tree, or to an empty hut. Uh, they sit down cross-legged, uh, set their body straight and establishes mindfulness in front of them. This is the introduction to the mindfulness of breathing. It is always the same. And again, you will see you have the same kind of 
starting point, go to the wilderness, to the root of a tree and empty hut. This is a serious meditation practice that ideally you do in seclusion. Yeah, that is kind of the background here. Now. And then having gone into that seclusion, you don't have to be in seclusion, absolutely, but it is the most conducive environment for this sort of practice, especially if you're going to take it all the way through, and because it is a very profound practice. You sit down cross-legged. Like some people say, if you don't sit cross-legged, you can't meditate, because it says in the sutta cross-legged, but I think that is too strict. I don't think that is quite true. I know many people who meditate in all kinds of postures, and uh, there are some postures we don't recommend, uh, like uh, standing on your head, that we don't recommend it. <laughs> but uh, apart from that, you can use almost any kind of posture, lying down, uh, sitting on a chair, leaning against something, yeah. um, walking meditation, obviously, but you don't do walking meditation, and watching the breath, you do other kinds of meditation, you do walking meditation. This is like a sitting thing. Yeah. So whatever is comfortable, that is the important thing. You set your body straight, yeah, because when you set your body straight, your mindfulness becomes a bit sharper, but uh, you wait till the mind is ready. Yeah? yeah, you can relax first of all, and then when the mind is ready, you straighten the body. This is the whole thing I've been talking about all along about making the mind ready before you watch the breath. Very often the mind is not in the right space, the mindfulness is not strong enough, and then you can't really do it. Yeah, and so you get these things right. When it feels right, when the mindfulness is strong, it feels right to sit straight. Yeah? When the tiredness is gone from the mind, then the straightness of the body comes by itself. And so these things are almost automatic if you do it in the right way. Yeah? And then it says you establish mindfulness in front of you. Yeah? is the Pali word. Establishing mindfulness in front of you, you will notice before you start watching the breath, right? And this is why I've been making this point throughout. Uh, you learn to relax, you learn to let go of any pains in the body, any tensions you have. You feel really at ease. You really want to be here. Yeah, when you really relax, things feel really comfortable. Yeah, you just, wow, how nice it is to be able to relax fully. Uh, to relax fully, uh, then you allow, uh, you kind of overcome the thinking mind about the past and the future a little bit. Uh, you enjoy being here. That is very supportive for mindfulness. When you enjoy being here, all of these little things, you put them into place. Yeah, You do a bit of body sweeping. Some of you have said, Adam Brown's body sweeping takes too long. I heard some of you say that. So you shorten it down a bit, right? Or whatever. Or you, you do little things like that. You don't focus too much on the breath. The breath is there because the breath is always around. But you don't make it a focus of your attention in the beginning. Yeah? And then when gradually, hopefully, mindfulness arises, uh, yeah, slowly, slowly, it's almost as if the breath comes to you. And this is a very nice way of thinking about it. Instead of thinking about you going to the breath, the moment you think about going to the breath, uh, you will grasp a little bit. Uh, so never think like that. Think instead, I will wait for the breath to come to me. Uh, so even if you lose the breath while you're meditating, yeah, don't go and grab the breath. Uh, yeah, as when you kind of become aware, just wait, wait, when the breath comes back, then you're doing mindfulness of breathing again. Then you are discouraging the doer, and you are encouraging passivity. And passivity is such an important part of this practice of meditation. Be passive, be a passenger, right? You're not the driver, you are the passenger. It's a beautiful idea, this idea of being the passenger. Being a passenger is so free, right? Don't have to do anything yet. Just enjoy it. Being in the back seat. Uh, it's like when you're a monk, I don't drive a car anymore. Uh, but people drive me everywhere. It's like you get the chauffeur when you become a monk. <laughs> it's one of the strange things. Uh, you don't even have a chauffeur because they're always different. Uh, but uh, people drive you happily. You have the Nicaragua and the monks who drive us. You have people who drive us in the monastery. Uh, we have this uh, old couple who originally from Vietnam. They I was a lot all the time, yeah, and they, uh, this is kind of what they live for, uh, and I was asked, them, what do you think, do you feel that we use you too much, you know, how often would you like to drive the monks, uh, and they said, that, oh, we're just sitting at home waiting to die anyway, so, uh, so we, we would be very happy to drive, 
It was a kind of interesting point, right? And it was kind of so they want to do some good karma, they want to help out. It's actually it's quite beautiful. And so like, okay, in that case, we will use you all the time. <laughs> So, uh, and that idea of being a passenger is actually so nice once you get used to it. Uh, yeah, you're not in the driver's seat, you're in the passenger seat. Uh, and whatever the driver does is fine. Uh, it's very nice because when people drive the bus, they can drive really nicely. Uh, they drive really gently, right? So really nicely. And I always say to the, the chauffeurs, they say, well, uh, wow, you drive really well, really nicely. And then I hear the wife of the back seat. Yeah, it's only when she dri he drives you that he drives like that. When he drives me, it's completely different. <laughs> it's very funny. And so they kind of really do that. So it's kind of, it's nice anyway to be the passenger. Yeah, so learn to be the passenger in life. Yeah, if other people want to drive, let them drive, be the passenger. That's what I recommend it. Because otherwise, being in the driver's seat actually is a bit of a nuisance, always having to make decisions. So you get no road rage. If you are in the passenger, passenger seat, no road rage, right? You can just relax. The driver is the one who gets the road rage. So anyway, a little bit, a little sidetrack maybe now, but anyway, we'll come back again. So the idea here is to establish mindfulness. And that comes from the passive mind, yeah, the mind that is aware without doing anything sitting on the train, looking out the window, allowing the scenery to be what it is. Uh, very often, don't judge yourself. Yes, there are some bad thoughts in the mind. Don't worry too much, uh, because we're just trying to let go and to observe. Uh, if the bad thoughts get a bit intrusive, okay, do something to overcome them. Uh, so then, once that mindfulness is established reasonably well, and remember that the establishment of mindfulness also happens through the long term, it is not just about what you do on an individual meditation, but it's about the overall how you live your life. And if you practice the first six factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, you are practicing the support for mindfulness. Remember that, yeah, it is so important. It is so critical. The whole life of a meditator depends on the first six factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, yeah. Two main things, right view and sila. Sila being your con general conduct and right view being the view in accordance with the reality, how the Buddha explains it. Then, when you do this regularly, mindfulness gets established, then you can start doing the mindfulness of breathing again. That is when it comes up. Yeah, get the sequence right. Some of you say that you go to the breath straight away. Okay, if it works, do that. Uh, but uh, investigate and make sure that it actually really works. So. Just mindful, they breathe in. Mindful, they breathe out. Yeah, just mindful. You notice the little word just, eva in Pali. And uh, sometimes these little words have meaning. They're not there randomly. And I think what it means is that you don't do anything yet. You just passive, you just aware, just mindful. Nothing you need to do. You don't make the breath long. You don't make it short. You are just mindful, just aware of what is going on. Now. Yeah, just mindful. They breathe in, mindful, they breathe out. The breathing happens by itself. The body does it. You don't have to do anything yet. Then breathing in heavily, you can say long, breathing in long and breathing in heavily. This is a translation. translation. They know I'm breathing in heavily. And when we start out, usually the breath is quite long. And so that's what that's why it is mentioned in this way. Breathing out heavily, you know that you're breathing out heavily. It is not, it is about knowing the breath. It doesn't really matter if the breath is long or short. It is about knowing the breath. And if the breath isn't long, okay, that's fine as well. This is just a general idea of watching the breath, right? It doesn't mean you have to watch a long breath. It just means that uh, that is the usual perception that people have. Uh, then breathing in lightly, they know I'm breathing in lightly. Breathing out lightly, they know I'm breathing out lightly. So this is already the practice kind of moving a little bit, yeah? So you go from the, the heavy breath to the light breath. As the meditation progresses, the, the breath becomes a little bit more short and light. Yeah, this is a natural thing, yeah? So you know these things. 
Yeah, they know this. Now comes they practice like this. The first two are knowing, now comes the practicing. They practice like this. I will breathe in experiencing the whole body. They practice like this. I will breathe out experiencing the whole body. Why does it say practice? Why does it say no beforehand? The reason is because initially your mindfulness is established. You don't need to try very much. It is automatic that you know the long and short breath, but it takes a while before you can experience the whole body of the breath. Yeah, That's why it says practice hard. Practicing here doesn't mean you try very hard. It just means that it takes a bit of time before you get there. You stay with the breath, eventually you're experiencing the whole body. Sabha, Kaya, Patisan, Vedi. Experiencing the whole body. What body? And the, the breath body. Yeah? Later down in the text, the, the breath is specifically to be said to be a body among bodies. Some people say that this means the physical body. Okay, whatever. If, you know, if that works for them and they can make it work, good do that but uh, i say the obvious thing here this is breath meditation it obviously means the breath body in my opinion uh, that's just following adam brown really because that's what he says and that's what the sutra says further down it does not make any sense to me that you should move from the breath into the physical body and then back to the breath again it seems weird to me uh, so i understand this to mean the whole breath of body uh, yeah so your mindfulness is expanding and uh, you're seeing more clearly, and you're seeing the entire breath. The practice like this, I will breathe in stilling the physical process. The practice like this, I will breathe out stilling the physical process. So physical process here is the kaya uh, sankaran, uh, kaya sankaran pasambati. Pasambati is to still, it's related to pasadi, which is one of the mental factors in deep meditation. Yeah, so you are stilling the physical process. Kaya sankara, the physical activity or the bodily activity. So this could mean the whole body, but because it is breath meditation, because the breath is really what you are aware of, the main reference is to the breath. Yes, yeah, so you're calming down the breath here. This is what is going on. There. This is the main thing. But of course, when you calm the breath, the body also calms down. Everything comes down essentially. And so at this point in the meditation, already things are getting quite nice. Yeah. Some of you who have meditated a long time, you will know these kind of experiences when things are becoming peaceful, the body is fading away, the breath is becoming kind of nice and subtle. Yeah, these are already beautiful experiences. But this is only the beginning. This is only step four out of 16. You're only starting on the journey of meditation, right? Uh, what comes next is much, much more interesting still. Uh, next one. They practice like this. Uh, I will breathe in experiencing rapture. Rapture is pity. Uh, they practice like this. I will breathe out experiencing rapture. Uh, yeah, rapture is pity. These are like the strong, often physical sensations of bliss can felt in the body, felt in the mind, almost like current sometimes going through you. You can maybe shudder a little bit at these kind of things. And this is the happiness, the joy really becoming um, very noticeable at this particular state, uh, stage. So how do we go from uh, calming the mind to experiencing bliss? This is very important. Uh, this is the area where many people say, I'm doing well, my meditation is going well, I'm not experiencing bliss. Why is that? Uh, what can I do? Uh, so this is the point of meditation where sometimes we need to nudge the mind a little bit. Uh, often it will happen automatically because you're living a pure life, you're living well, and the bliss just arises when the breath becomes peaceful. And sometimes it doesn't. Uh, and then a little bit of nudging may be required. Yeah, Just a simple thing like... Uh, reminding yourself of something beautiful in your life. Beautiful thing, like, I mentioned all these things already, but, you know, like your Kalyana Mithras, and, and something nice that you have done, uh, just a general perception that you're living a good life, uh, the idea that the Buddha is your teacher, uh, that you have these amazing teachings to guide you, uh, that there are, uh, you know, that any one of these things, a sense of gratitude, uh, 
to everyone around for being here with you, a bit of metta or compassion that you bring up in your meditation at that particular point. Uh, anything that has the energy and give rise to happiness and joy, uh, this is what you do. But you have to be very careful here because things are already very, very, very peaceful. Uh, if you start thinking, it will destroy the meditation. Yeah, Already at this point, you're hardly thinking at all. Uh, and so that's why I call it nudging the mind. Uh, it's like just a giving rise to a perception almost, yeah? Like a very brief memory of something happening in the past, uh, very gently, uh, yeah? And then when it comes out, a little bit of joy and happiness comes. Uh, you bring that together with the breath, uh, and then you carry on the breath meditation on that basis. Uh, so either it happens by itself, uh, or you nudge a little bit to make this happen. Yeah, now it becomes really, really attractive. Uh, now you don't, can't get enough of meditating, yeah? When you get to this stage, uh, yeah, at least initially. After a while, you think this kind of bliss is ordinary, yeah, like uh, whatever. But uh, initially, this is wow, this is really cool. What you're learning about here is the spiritual happiness. It's an entirely different kind of happiness from what we are used to. Uh, the happiness of the world, you understand very quickly, is kind of coarse. It always has craving coming with it, which is always not really satisfied, not really contented. This is a contented kind of happiness. We are so happy just to be here, not to do anything else, just experiencing joy, just experiencing happiness. You're starting to really understand what the spiritual life, what the purpose of the spiritual life is all about. This is where you start to understand this. These are the things that we are looking out for on the spiritual path. And this becomes stronger and stronger and stronger until you get to the jhana states, when you kind of are blown out of your mind because the bliss is so powerful. Yeah. So, uh, they practice like this. I will breathe in experiencing bliss. This is sukha. They practice like this. I will breathe out experiencing bliss. Even more happiness, higher degree of happiness, more peaceful than the happiness of PT. Yeah. Why is you keep the meditation going? Remember, you're not really doing anything apart from the little nudging I would say, you're doing nothing. You're just sitting back in the passenger seat, enjoying the view, and the view is getting better and better and better as you're looking out the window. Now the bliss is coming up. Difference between bliss and and uh, rapture is that it is more peaceful. It is a deeper kind of happiness that is happening here. Yeah. They practice like this. I'll breathe in experiencing the mental processes. They practice like this. I will breathe out experiencing the mental processes. The mental processes are just more of the same. The mental processes is precisely the bliss that you are experiencing. Yeah, that is the mental process at that time. It is defined in the suttas as sandhya and vedana, which is perception and feeling. And this is the perception and feeling you have now, is the perception of bliss. So it's even more enjoyment of the bliss. Yeah, this is basically all it means. Then the practice like this, I will breathe out stilling the mental processes. I will practice like this. Uh, I will breathe out, stilling the mental processes. So uh, now calming down even more, right? Calming down that joy, calming down the happiness that you have. So it is less exciting, it is more peaceful, it is more profound. And you will start to notice a pattern here as we're doing this. So there's two things that seem to be going on. One is the calming down. Yeah, first of all, the calming down of the breath. Now the calming down of the mental state. So the calming, 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 more and more peaceful. And the other one is the bliss and the happiness, getting more and more subtle, more and more refined, more and more powerful. And this is why these are the two things you should look out for in your meditation. These are the two things that tell you that you are on the right track. These are like the signposts on the side of the road, yeah? Telling you you're heading in the right direction. Peace and happiness, yeah? Becoming more and more profound, both of these things. You can see it here. Here is even more clear than in the standard exposition that I talk about, dependent liberation. Here there are even more steps with peace and bliss, peace and bliss, building up, building up, building up. So the first
first four steps that we saw first, uh, that is equivalent to the body contemplation of the Satipatthana Sutta. These four steps we have just looked at now are equivalent to the Vedana contemplation, the contemplation of feelings. Uh, and what you will notice, and this is really significant to my mind, uh, there is nothing there in my painful feelings. Uh, if you read the Satipatthana Sutta, it says you have to know the painful feelings of the body, of the mind, the neutral feelings, the happy feelings. Uh, here it says nothing about this. Uh, and yet, this fulfills uh, the contemplation of feelings. Uh, so how is that possible? Uh, why is there this discrepancy? And the answer actually is very simple. Uh, the reason is because you understand the painful feelings by abandoning them. Uh, when you abandon something, that is when you understand something. Uh, if you are in the middle of it, it is actually impossible to understand it. Yeah, so it is like the famous symbol of the frog, the tadpole in water. Tadpole doesn't know what water is. It's only when the tadpole becomes the frog, jumps out of the water. Oh yeah, that was what water was. Now I understand. You have to remove yourself from the situation. Only then can you understand it. And this is such a beautiful thing, isn't it? No need to experience pain. No need to experience all these negative things. You just come out of it, and then when you look back, then you understand what those things were. Isn't that great? Don't experience too much pain. Don't sit there for long periods of oh, pain, pain, observing, observing. Please don't do that. It is not actually necessary according to this sutras. If you experience a lot of pain, change your posture. Then there is a chance that you will be able to endure and persevere in meditation because you are enjoying it rather than um, having to endure the torment of the body, uh, which uh, is sometimes uh, how meditation is taught. And the reason why it is taught like that is because of a one-sided focus on the Satipatthana Sutta. As soon as you look at the Anapanasati Sutta, which is the way anyway of practicing Satipatthana, this is, said, this is the only way the Buddha says how you fulfill Satipatthana, so this is how we should be doing it. Uh, People forget about that and they focus only on the Satipatthana Sutta and they forget that the suttas are more than one sutta. You have to take everything into account. Then you understand how the path works. So I'm just encouraging you here not to, please don't, please be um, careful when you interpret the suttas. Uh, don't buy into uh, people's opinions about what should be done and how things should be done. Sometimes uh, People get it wrong, yeah? And uh, I may get it wrong too, and if I get it wrong, please let me know. But at least this is my view of this whole issue now. Ah, time is going fast. So let us um, carry on. Uh, I, I think this is the most important part that I have been reading out, because that is the part which is uh, where most people are at. Uh, but now we go even further. Now we go to the third tetra, the ninth step of the Anapanasati. They practice like this. I will breathe in experiencing the mind. They practice like this. I will breathe out experiencing the mind. What does that mean? Well, that means that the mind is that which is left over when non-mind has disappeared. What is non-mind? The five senses and the body. That disappears, the mind is left. That's how you experience the mind. How it is usually experienced is through an emitter, a bright light in the mind. That is usually how it is experienced. And uh, again, you may have to nudge the mind a little bit at this stage. Yeah? Just a quick reminder of the, uh, the downside of the five senses, a quick perception, and just rejecting that. And then sometimes the mind moves over and lets go a little bit extra. And then the nimitta may arise as a consequence. The most important thing here is to go with the bliss, because already the meditation is becoming really, really blissful. Carry on with the bliss. Then the practice like this, I will breathe out gladdening the mind. I will breathe in gladdening the mind. The practice like this, I will breathe in stilling the mind in samadhi. Practice like this, I will breathe out stilling the mind in samadhi. Yeah? Gladdening the mind, even more happiness, even deeper happiness. As I was saying, yeah, just happiness. And then the stilling the mind, more peace, more happiness again. And so happiness and peace all the way through. 
And then we come into the very last part, the practice like this, I will breathe in freeing the mind. The practice like this, I will breathe out freeing the mind. Freeing the mind, freeing from what? Freeing from the five senses and the body. Freeing from the defilements, the five hindrances. The mind is free from all of these negative things. That means, usually the suttas, vimocha and chittang, means entering jhana state. At this point, you enter the jhanas. This is the process you have to go through to enter the jhanas. Then, when you come out of those jhanas, you come out of your meditation, then you can start to think about, well, what does all of this mean? What is the insight? And this is the last four, and I've spoken about these already, so I will just, just note them briefly, just go through them, so that we have actually gone through the whole suit. I'll be a few minutes over time this time, so please bear with me. The practice like this, I will breathe in observing impermanence. The practice like this, I will breathe out observing impermanence. The practice like this, I will breathe in observing fading away. The practice like this, I will breathe out observing fading away. The practice like this, I will breathe in observing cessation. The practice like this, I will breathe out observing cessation. The practice like this, I will breathe in observing letting go, Patinisaga. The practice like this, I will breathe out observing letting go. This is called mindfulness of breathing. So this last tetra, the last four here, they are about and more about insight. So you come out of your meditation. Yeah, you are finished with the breath meditation. Now you look back upon the process. You look back upon what has happened. And what you see is you see these things happening before. Things were changing, they were impermanent. Things were gradually fading away. The body was fading away, the senses were fading away, the will was fading away, and it is fading away until it ceases, observing cessation. It comes to a complete end. And when you see things coming to a complete end, you know they are not self, because things that have completely ceased, things that, that are no longer available to you, yeah, they must, they cannot be a self, because they're not available, they are outside of your agreement, so to speak, you cannot access them anymore, eh? non-self. And they're also dukkha, because you're far better off without those things. Eh? So you are seeing the three characteristics in the five khandas. The five khandas is just the process of breathing. That is the five khandas changing. You're looking at that process through the uh, filter of the three characteristics, and this is how insight happens. And then the result of all that insight is letting go. But it is got the last one. And this is where you become a stream entry and ultimately an arahant. This is the purpose of mindfulness of breathing. It takes you all the way to awakening. And isn't that marvelous and wonderful? The humble, simple breath. If you follow the breath in the right way, you become an arahant. Yeah, isn't this great? No hocus pocus. No crazy ideas, no wild imaginations, uh, just the humble breath, really down to earth, practical advice. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I like the early suttas, uh, because they are simple, practical, down to earth. Uh, yeah, this is the beauty, beauty with them. Uh, and this is one of the things I like about them. Uh. Anyway, let's just quickly go to the very last parts of the sutta. Uh, if you were to recite to the mendicant Girimananda these ten perceptions, uh, it is possible that after hearing them, his illness will die down on the spot. Uh, so this is what the Buddha tells Venerable Ananda. And then Ananda, having learned these ten perceptions from the Buddha himself, went to Girimananda and recited them. Then after Girimananda heard these ten perceptions, his illness died down on the spot. Uh, and that is how he recovered from that uh, illness. Okay. Girimananda Sutta Nikitanya. <laughs> it means Girimananda Sutta is finished. So that is it for now. So uh, please have a nice cup of tea. Do what you, as you see fit. And we'll see you back in at 7.30 this evening.